Well, good morning. I, I really enjoy that song. Yeah. Welcome to Forge Road Bible Chapel. My name is Paul Dumb, and uh, I'll be bringing the message this morning. I can't tell you how excited we are uh, that you're here, that you're here with us as we continue to fellowship in this way that's a little bit odd, but, uh, but we're, we're just happy that we are together. And I know you're out there, and, uh, and we're going to enjoy our worship and, our, and, and opening the Word this morning together. Uh, we're, we're in the second week of our series in Philippians. Norris Gorman gave us an excellent overview uh, last week, and this week we're going to be starting uh, in earnest in our text. So if you'd like to take a Bible, uh, you can read on your own. We're going to read uh, the first 18 verses of Philippians chapter 1, or you can watch it on the screen. And I'm going uh, to ask my friend Luke Payton if he'll read uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Luke? Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, Thank you that we can open your word. Thank you we can learn from it. Lord, our, our ears are dull and our hearts, um, our hearts are hard. Uh, but we pray that you would soften them and that your spirit would tell us what we needed to hear. Uh, that you'd work through my words. Lord, thank you for each one who's here. We ask for your blessing on this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple months ago, um, I was at the chapel and one of my very favorite people, uh, Bonnie Peverill. Bonnie, I hope you're listening because uh, I really want to embarrass you here because she came up to me in between meetings and uh, she asked me if she could ask a couple questions. And I yeah, said, sure, that's fine. Turned out these were very hard questions uh, that Bonnie asked. The first one, I think, was something like, what's the most difficult part of being an elder at, at Forge Road Bible Chapel? And I say, I think, because I'm not really sure uh, about that question. I, I certainly don't remember my answer. Um, I don't like to think about stuff like that, and I just hope it wasn't, it wasn't in, entirely terrible. Uh, but the second question was, what is the best part of being an elder at Forge Road Bible Chapel? And, um, you know, when somebody asks you a question about something important, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it, it's, an, it's a hard question, it, and Sometimes you, if you answer off the top of your head, you look back and you think, you know, I, I wish I had said this, or maybe I, I should have phrased it that way. And, 
you know, the, the thing was, in this case, there was absolutely none of that. None of that. I remember distinctly uh, what she asked and, and what I said, and I would say it every single time it's asked. The best part about being an elder at Forge River Bible Chapel um, is when I'm sitting at the Lord's table, and, or, or maybe I'm standing up at, uh, during music, during our worship time, and, and I look across the room, and I see people, I see families uh, that are there. And some of you I've, I've known for f- over 40 years. Some of you I've known for, uh, for just a few weeks. Some of you, uh, to my shame, I, I've, I've not yet met. But, but you're all there, um, and you don't have to be. You know, there, there are lots of other very good churches in the area you could go to, lots of interesting things that you uh, might want to do on a, on a beautiful Sunday morning uh, such as this, but we're there together. We're, we're partnering together in this, this ministry, this body of Jesus Christ, this physical manifestation of his presence in this world, and you have chosen to serve with us in that place, and, and that thought uh, is, is just the very best part for me of of being an elder. And I think that might be just a little tiny glimpse of what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is feeling as he's writing that letter to his friends at the church of Philippi. And you can, you can just hear the emotion in his voice as he starts, I thank my God, you know, the joy, the, 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 the thanksgiving, the, 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 the generous use of superlative, right? I thank my God every time. I remember you always in every prayer of mine uh, for all of you making my prayer with joy. To me, the the apostle, in his own way, he's looking out over that congregation that he remembers in Philippi. He's he's overwhelmed by thankfulness that these people have given their lives. You know, in in a time when giving their lives meant something very different than it does today, they giving their lives to be partners in the gospel. And he's he's overflowing with thankfulness. He's he's, he's gushing. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because because I hold you in my heart. For you're all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, he says. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. I thank my God every day time I remember you. Always. Every time. Why? Why? Because you're partners, he says. He, because, because you're partners in the gospel. And that's going to be our theme this morning, partners in the gospel. I don't know why I chose uh, puzzle pieces as my theme. Um, maybe it's because uh, Carol and I have done uh, at least a dozen puzzles right here in our living room. Over the past few weeks, as I've uh, procrastinated horribly in my pre- preparation, um, you know, but what is partnership? What, what are we partnering in? What are we, who are we partnering with? What, what's Paul actually saying to his readers? What's it, what, and, and, and what importance could it possibly have for us as, as, as we're here today? Well, we're familiar with partnerships in our society. There's lots of them, and Usually they're, they're, they're business-related or maybe some are political or, 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 or social. We, have, we know lots of examples of partnerships. But, but this partnership, this is different. This, is, this partnership is built on, it, it's, it's founded on a single principle. This is the, the foundation of this partnership is, is a single truth, not, not truth in the, in the big concept sense. This is a single, very specific, and, and ultimately for, for all of humanity, the most important truth that there is. It's the gospel. It's, it's the good news. In Greek, it's the, the, the evangelion. It's the evangelion is a, is a, is, is a word where we get, uh, we get lots of church words like uh, evangelism or, or, or evangelical. Um, it's up, and this partnership, our partnership that we're talking about, is founded on a true story 
a truth, a true story, the good news that God, God, the, the, the ultimate, eternal, transcendent, omnipotent creator, holy, separate, he's, he's totally other than us. He's this, that God, that God came, he, he took, the, took a human body, and he humbled himself, coming into the midst of his own creation. He came to earth. And this was a creation, not that welcomed him, this was a creation that rebelled against him and, and tried over and over again to set themselves up as their own God. He came here. And not only that, this truth, this good news goes on to say that he was rejected by this creation. He was, he was denied. He was discarded. He was unwanted to the point where, unbelievably, he was, he was murdered by his own people. But in, in that very act, Jesus Christ was working to accomplish his own goal, his own goal of of expiating, of, uh, that, that, that's another church word, of, of turning away, of satisfying God's wrath by, by paying the price with his own life for our rebellion. Jesus, he gave his life to save us. And not only that, but this truth, this good news goes on as, as Jesus Jesus beats death itself. He goes, up, he goes up against death, and he wins. By his own bodily, miraculous resurrection from the dead, he proves once and for all that he's conquered not just death, but, but our own rebelliousness, our sin as well. He paid the price with his own perfect life. And death and resurrection, he paid the price, and we can be restored to a relationship, to a union with him. Jesus invites us to a relationship with him, as he always intended. It's a, it's a remarkable story. Maybe it is the most remarkable story. And some of us have heard it so many times, well, at least I'll speak for myself, you know, I think I'm not sufficiently stunned by how good this news really is. You know, sometimes I like to imagine what it would be like um, to be hearing that word, this good news for the first time. You know, like maybe like those people in Jerusalem on that on that first Pentecost. You know, they hear it and they're immediately, the Bible says, they're immediately cut to the heart, and they, they recognize the good news for what it is, and, and they, know, they know immediately that they need to do something. They need to change their lives. And it would be, you know, my greatest hope this morning that if there's somebody here who has not entered into this partnership in the gospel, that you'd consider it, that you'd think about how good this news really is and how much... Uh, you might need it, and, and that, 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 that this good news would maybe catch your attention in a way this morning um, that it never has before. The, 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 our, our partnership in the gospel is built on a truth. It is built, it is founded on a truth. That's the first point, and the second point, our second, uh, second piece of the puzzle, what's the nature of this partnership? Partners in the gospel our partners in the gospel is founded on truth and it is built on relationship. It is built on relationship. Relationship. Well, that's, that's kind of obvious. We're, we're partners after all. I mean, uh, there's, there's certainly some aspect in every partnership where there's, there's working together uh, of, of, of people that are involved. And, and this theme of working together is scattered throughout the book of Philippians. So you can look at uh, verses that we read this morning, we, you're partakers with me of grace, later in, verse, in chapter 1, striving side by side for the faith, served with me in the gospel, Paul says. He describes them as my brother, my fellow worker, my, and my fellow soldier. Join in imitating me. Join together, laboring side by side with me, partnering with me in giving and receiving. There's, there, there's an aspect all the way through the book of working together, 
of relationship as we partner in this gospel. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we heard from Tom Shedlick, and he talked about the partnership that we had um, in a very physical way as we built uh, the building at Forge Road and how wonderful and, and, and satisfying it was to join together and, and to accomplish something um, in the Lord. And, and, and we see that kind of partnership all the time as, as we work together, as we're in it together. And, and I think even now in this current, you know, forced distancing kind of environment, it's caused everybody, not, not just uh, those of us in the church, everybody seems to be reflecting, you know, on, on how much these relationships mean and, and, and how much we're reliant on each other. And everybody's, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together. I hear it all the time. And if I, if I see Zach Efron one more time, it's going to, you know. Uh, but, yeah, so you know, relationships are hugely important. And as much, you know, as much as I love Paul's tone at the beginning of this letter, you know, it's warm, it's loving, um, it's how we should all speak to each other all the time. As much as I appreciate that, what interests me about relationships uh, in this partnership um, is a little bit different because, you know, Paul didn't live in some strange world, some weird universe where everybody just loves uh, everybody else. Not, not every partnership is, uh, is, is a beautiful, loving thing. I know someone uh, who's in a firm, uh, has a, a partnership with, uh, with, with, with several other men. Uh, they've been partners for over 30 years. And uh, do they love each other? Well, this, as far as I can tell, they don't even like each other. Uh, every partnership is not quite as, uh, as, as loving as maybe what, what we hear in some of Paul's words. I mean, we're human beings, right, after all. And, and, and while we, we work toward loving each other, we're, we're commanded to do that. Sometimes, sometimes it's just not very easy. I'm sure you've I've, I've said it to my kids on more than one occasion. I love you dearly, but right now, um, I just don't like you very much. And, uh, you know, we're all fallen. We're broken people. We hurt each other way too much. The question is, really, how do we handle uh, that wrinkle in those relationships? Sometimes uh, when, when, when things don't go well, especially in relationship with other believers, other partnership, other partners in the gospel. You know, when I when I look back at those pictures of the building of Forge Road Bible Chapel, you might think it was all love and joy, and we agreed on every single decision, and every budget was met, and every schedule was kept. But I'm here to tell you, it wasn't like that. it wasn't like that. It was um, it was hard work, and there was difficulty. There were disagreements. There was conflict then, and there's conflict now, and there's going to be conflict in the future. We are, after all, human beings, and the church at Philippi was absolutely no different. It was a, it was a real place with real people, and Paul's not gazing back with these rose-colored glasses at some perfect church where everybody's lovingly working together. Look, we, we, we already read it in chapter 1 about there were people there who were preaching Jesus Christ, but who were actively working against the Apostle Paul, even while he was in prison. Listen to this in, in chapter 1. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of gospel, but the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. How's that for a difficult relationship? How, someone's actually trying to humiliate, to, to shame, to tear down Paul while he's in prison, as if pr prison weren't enough shame. Can you imagine somebody going behind your back and actively undermining your, your reputation? with your friends, is, is there any, anything worse that people could do? And yet, and yet, Paul goes on and he says, what then? What then? Only in every way, whether 
in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Paul says, what then? Or so what? So what? What's important is not me, it's not my reputation, it's not what people think of me. What's important is the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel, our partnership in the gospel. That's what Paul's perspective was. That's what was important. How do we handle it when, when relationships uh, go awry? How do we handle it when, when we're attacked personally? When people talk about us behind our back, how do we handle it when our reputation is uh, maligned? Is it possible for us to, 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 to take that perspective, to say, you know what, so what? So what? There's a, there's, there's a bigger picture involved. In chapter 4 of Philippians, ta Paul talks about two women in Philippi. Two real women, Yodia and Syntyche. Um, they had maybe the most famous uh, disagreement in, uh, in church history. And we have no idea what it was, what it was about. We, and it really doesn't matter, does it? Because whatever it is, it, it's happened to all of us. There's a conflict. And we don't always get along with everybody. We just don't always agree. But Paul says to them simply, I implore you to agree with each other in the Lord. We're going to hear more about in the future as, as, as Kyle talks about Philippians 4 later in May. But, but can we do that? Even in the midst of of conflict, even in the midst of, of people doing things to us that are unfair, that are wrong, that are hurtful? Can we agree with each other? Can we get along for the sake of this partnership in the gospel? Our partnership in the gospel is, is founded on a truth. It's built on relationships. And the, uh, the third piece of the puzzle, uh, what do we do? What do we do in this partnership? Our relationships are, uh, are, are expressed in giving. Giving. That's right. I said it. Giving. And you're saying to yourselves, oh, now, now, now he's done it. Now he's done it. I remember when I was, um, when I was a boy a long time ago, uh, my family was in a, an assembly in Rochester, New York. And I remember one Sunday, um, they were reading one of those letters that you get from a missionary far, far away, let's say, you know, Papua New Guinea, I don't know. And the letter was warm and friendly and, you know, not unlike Paul's letter uh, to the Philippians. And it thanked us for the fellowship last month. And I remember thinking, fellowship last month? What, who, who, who went to Papua New Guinea? What, where, did, did these people come back for, for, for a quick say? Ah, no one has seen these people. What, what, what does it mean that we had fellowship uh, last month? And I remember my father, uh, as I pondered this question, kind of smiling at me, and he says, he says they're talking about money. They're talking about money. We sent the money, and that's what they're, uh, they're thanking us for. And I thought, you know, what a ridiculous way of referring to money, fellowship. And it, it, it wasn't until um, – uh, embarrassingly recently that I realized this wasn't just some, you know, awkward assembly way of not referring to money. This is exactly what Paul says in Philippians. Thank you for your fellowship. Fellowship is uh, it's kind of an old-fashioned word. It seems like the only time we use it now is in church or in um, Peter Jackson movies. Um, but it's a translation of a, word, a Greek word that you might know. Koinonia is the Greek word is translated here in Philippians 1.5. And when Paul is talking about fellowship or partnership, he's doing exactly what that missionary was doing so many years ago. He's thanking them for giving money to him, for resources to live and to work and to continue to, to spread the good news. And if you're, if you're skeptical, uh, look at Philippians 4. Let's go back to Philippians 4. I'll steal a little bit more from Kyle. Uh, Philippians 4, 15 and 16, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the, of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership 
that is fellowship, that is koinonia, with me in giving and receiving, except you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. This partnership in the gospel is expressed in giving money. There's, uh, there's no doubt about it. That's what, we, that, that's what we do in this partnership. Now, we don't like to talk about money. We hardly ever do it, and it's really for, for at least two reasons. The first one is real, and the, it's because the Lord says uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you give to the needy, don't let your right hand know what your left is doing. There should be some, some secrecy, some discretion there. Uh, you're, you're not to be showy about how you give. And, and so in this, in this personal command that the Lord gives to us, we sort of obey kind of corporately, and, 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 and we refrain from talking about money a lot. And, that, and that's one reason. The second reason is more unfortunate. In fact, that as long as there's been a church, sadly, uh, there have been those who are interested in making a profit off it. The gospel is, after all, it's the best news ever. And there are a lot of people over the years who have recognized its value. And as Paul says right here in, in chapter 117, he says, some proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. It's sad. In 2 Corinthians, he says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. You know, it, it's, sadly, greedy preachers did not begin with Jim Baker and televangelists in the 1980s. And they're not going to end with, uh, with Joel Osteen and the prosperity gospel hawkers of today. And so, as a result, we don't talk about money because we're afraid to be associated with that. And that's sad because giving is the expression of our partnership in the gospel. Giving is a huge part of that partnership. When we give, we become part of the work of the gospel. Now, we can't all work full-time in the gospel. That was never the intention of the early church, and it's not the intention now. But for those of us that were, are called to service in the local church and to secular vocation employment, we have this unique opportunity to share in the ministries of those in the field. I, I was talking to to our, to our brother Brad Sturm about this recently. You know, your gifts are an enormous source of encouragement to him, not just because of the money, but because of the support that it shows. It shows that you're with him in your thoughts. It shows that you're praying for him. It's, it shows that you're supporting him, that you're absolutely with him on the field. There's a partnership there, just as if you were there. And it's not just with Brad, it's with all the ministries that we at Forge Road give to, uh, both in this country and around the world. And when we give, not only do we support those who spread the gospel, but we, we have the opportunity to give to those in, in need right here at home, and right now, especially when there are so many in need. Now, we're never, ever, ever going to tell you that you're going to get rich giving money to the church, but I will encourage you that you should give. You should give for your own well-being, for your own credit. Paul goes on in chapter 4, and he, and he says, not that I seek the gift. Chapter 4, verse 17, not that I seek the gift. I don't need the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That's, that's the balance we want to strike. You, you need to be in partnership in this, in, in, in this gospel. You need to have the opportunity to participate in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means you need to give. But it's not for us. It's not that Forge Road Bible Chapel needs your money. The Lord will take care of us. The Lord will take care of us. We don't seek your gifts, but we do seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now, I, I don't claim to know exactly what that means. And whether the Lord credits you materially or, or otherwise, whether it's in, the, in, in this life or, or whether it's in glory, I don't know. But I know he is, he is faithful, and he will do it. I just want to finish this thought uh, by looking at one related passage real quickly. Paul talks 
about this church at Philippi elsewhere. He brags about them, actually. Uh, in, in, when, he, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's writing to the Corinthians, and he's bragging about the Philippians. Now, Cor keep in mind, Corinth is in southern Greece. Philippi is in Macedonia in northern Greece. And this is what Paul says. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now, that's a beautiful sentence, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. I don't know how awkward it might have been taken bragging uh, about one church in the north to another church in the south, but I believe Paul trusted uh, the believers that the believers in Corinth would take this praise uh, only in the most positive way. So, so let me say something to my family at Forge Road that I know they'll take with the same spirit of, of generosity. Because I, I love my family at Forge Road Bible Chapel. And I have uh, a unique seat to see how generous and how sacrificially uh, you're giving. Even in these times of affliction, even in these times of certainty, it's a pleasure. It is a great pleasure to see your faithfulness. The apostle, uh, he says it, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. But I also have this to say about our brothers and sisters. There are brothers and sisters this morning with us from Brooklyn Bible Chapel. And uh, the, the, the fellowship at Brooklyn Bible Chapel, your partnership in the gospel your, your fellowship in the gospel is amazing. And it is known uh, throughout the churches in Baltimore and, and way beyond. Because out of the abundance of your joy, as Paul says, has overflowed a wealth of generosity. And we rejoice in, in what you have done to further the gospel throughout the world. Partnership in the gospel is expressed in giving. Now we have one more, just a few minutes. We'll close with this. What's the future? What's the future of this partnership? Our partnership in the gospel, our partnership in the gospel is secure. Its future is secure. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, there are lots of ways um, of describing. There are lots of phrases to describe how we enter into uh, this partnership in the gospel. We talk about accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, asking him into our heart, uh, having a personal relationship with him, trusting him as Savior, putting our faith in it. There, there, there are lots of phrases. Some of them are more biblical than others, but, but they all imply action on our part, and rightly so. Uh, as I said before, if you're interested in the good news of Jesus Christ today, and if you want to enter into the part and enter into this partnership, you need to, as 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 Paul said really simply to the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, he says, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." You need to make this choice. You need to do this. But there's another way of describing uh, our entry into this partnership. Paul says in Philippians 1:6. He who, he who began a good work in you. He who began a good work in you. And it's one of, the, one of the great mysteries of the gospel. Entry into this partnership not only requires our decision to submit our lives to him, but it requires and it, and it benefits from, hugely, enormously, eternally benefits from God himself beginning the work, the really exciting truth about this partnership is that it isn't subject to the variations of my own thoughts and my own decisions. I am unreliable. I make poor decisions all the time. 
But Paul says, since God started it, since his work, since it's his work, and here, here's the whole verse. He says, and I am sure of this, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Since he started it, he will complete it. Our partnership is secure until the day of Christ Jesus. There are all sorts of uncertainties in this world. We're experiencing uncertainties right now every day. And it's interesting to me that when you're in the middle of something like this, it, it's kind of hard to imagine it being over. Uh, you know, Carol and I read the, the COVID-19 stats every day, and, and, and they just don't seem to be getting better. And you wonder, you wonder when is it going to be over? When, and, and it's hard to imagine going back and, and back to normal. And that's sort of a picture of our lives, I think. While we're in the middle of a trial, it, it's hard to imagine it being over. But I can say this. I can say this. I'm, I'm glad you're with me. I'm, I'm glad that we're in this partnership, this partnership in the gospel together. I'm glad that it's founded in truth. I'm glad that, it is, uh, that, that it's built on relationship, relationship with you that it's expressed in giving, that its future is secure. And I know, I know we have a good God. I know we have a Savior who loves us. And I know that he always, always, always finishes what he started. Thanks for listening. Let's pray. And then we're going to close with a song. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel, the good news that he came, that he lived, that he died and rose again for us. Lord, it is amazing that we are a part of a partnership in that gospel. I thank you for each one that's here with us. I thank you for, uh, for Forge Road Bible Chapel. I thank you for Brooklyn Bible Chapel. And I thank you for, 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 for places throughout this country and the world where believers are getting together in all sorts of different ways and are worshiping you, and are proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing better to do. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen.